Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Bhutang Dhammang Sankhang Namasami. Traditionally in Buddhism we talk about three stages of practice or three stages of approaching the teaching. And I'd like to talk about these three stages tonight and particularly relate it to the specific aspect of practice to do with compassion. These uh, three stages of progress in taking up the teaching and making the teaching the focal point for our life, the way we make choices about our lifestyle, the way we make decisions about the things that are important to us in our life. These three stages relate, first of all, the first one is the stage where we are starting to become familiar with the teaching. When we listen to talks, when we read books, when we start to get an understanding of what the Dharma is about, we start to become familiar with some of the Pali terms perhaps. So the Pali term for this uh, stage of practice is called Pariyati. And this is the stage of if you like, conceptual learning, conceptual understanding. Someone else is telling us what the teaching is about. Someone else is explaining to us how things work and perhaps inspiring us to start to use some of these teachings in our own life and when we move from the point of listening and reading and starting to uh, get a handle on the teaching that someone else has given us, when we move to the next stage we start to put the teaching into practice in our own lives as much as we understand what that teaching is and this is moving to the next uh, stage of taking up the teaching the pati pati stage the stage of practice in which can uh, include all the different aspects of the noble eightfold path that are to do with sila, morality, right speech, right action, right livelihood, taking the five precepts, committing ourselves to trying to live harmlessly, honestly, with integrity, refraining from using drugs and alcohol, refraining from sexual misconduct, interfering in uh, established relationships, being true in our commitments, looking at our livelihood and evaluating for ourselves whether our livelihood is keeping the standards that we've set ourselves, whether it's Uh, supporting us in moving in the direction of living 
a good life, starting perhaps to evaluate our priorities, whether we're really mostly concerned with uh, the salary and the status that comes from our job, for example, or whether we now start to give more importance to the way our heart feels when we do the job that we're doing, what kind of uh, relationships it encourages between ourselves and our workmates, whether it uh, creates so much stress in our life that our family life is uh, adversely affected. We start to look at those things and maybe reevaluate what we want from our livelihood and what we want to get out of our life. And we start to recognise the effect that our daily life behaviour has on the mind that we bring to meditation. So when we start to practice the teaching, we also become more familiar with the mind itself and the relationship between our lifestyle, our relationships and the way we feel internally, what our inner household is like. And again when we start to recognise that the Dharma is helping us to explore these aspects of our life and giving us guidelines on how to uh, live that will bring more peace and harmony into our life, then we decide that we're going to try to apply the guidelines that we've been uh, shown. And particularly if we are very interested in developing our mind in meditation, we recognise fairly quickly that unless we look at the rest of our life, then our meditation is never going to flourish. That it's not enough to just sit for an hour even every day if the rest of our day is full of turmoil, full of uh, tension or full of uh, unhappiness and we start to see that the causes for friction, tension, unhappiness in our life goes far beyond what we can or what we were thinking of in just the present moment, we start to see the connections between the past and how we've lived and the decisions that we've made and the way we're living now, the kind of lifestyle we have and what we can get out of our mind if we are starting to value peace, harmony, inner ease. So we start to see a bigger picture, the broader picture of what creates our experience in the present moment and in terms of practice we recognise that if we're going to use the teachings to their uh, greatest advantage that we have to make an even deeper commitment to the practice than we perhaps imagined would be necessary. So many people come to meditation, come to uh, Buddhism because they want to learn to meditate, because they've uh, heard, read, been told that they'll become more peaceful, they'll get on better with uh, their family, their health will improve if they learn to meditate. And so many people come along here with that in mind and take up meditation in isolation from the rest of their life. And once you start to look into the mind in meditation, there comes a point where you recognise 
that if you really want to make deep changes and if you really want to get the maximum benefit out of what is the potential for peace in the mind then you need to do more than just come say once a week and sit here for half an hour to learn meditation. It has to become something that is applied in everyday life. <clears throat> and from that realisation right through to the point where true wisdom arises, this is all the path of practice. The second um, part of the Noble Eightfold Path which has to do with right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration is about the practices we need to develop in order to work directly with the mind. Right effort is the practice of being able to pay attention to what's going on in the mind and to recognise what thoughts are helpful, productive of happiness and what thoughts bring suffering, what thoughts lead to unhappiness and then being able to develop the skills to remove the thoughts that are productive of unhappiness and to bring into the mind the thoughts that make us more happy, more peaceful and to be able to actively cultivate those thoughts which lead to happiness. So thoughts that encourage us to sit in meditation, thoughts that encourage us to keep the precepts, thoughts that encourage us to think about the welfare of others, those kinds of thoughts, when we're developing right effort, we try to make those kinds of thoughts occur more often so that they become a stronger part of our mental uh, repertoire, if you like. And then not only to have them as thoughts in the mind that uh, come and go, but thoughts that start to propel us into action. In order to be able to start to look at the mind in this way, we have to develop mindfulness. Mindfulness that keeps the mind in the present moment, paying attention to what's going on, not being uh, scattered, not being uh, distracted, being focused and clearly seeing what's going on. And then with that clear seeing, having the strength to do what, what's necessary. And in order to develop that strength, we need to develop the mind in meditation to be calm and clear. And this is what we've been doing tonight in the meditation of just staying focused on the breath. When we're able to stay focused on the breath moment after moment the mind is able to settle down being able to stay in one place not only allows the mind to settle it allows the mind to contain its energy it helps the mind to strengthen and with that silence that comes from the mind not being distracted, not wandering away, we start to discover an inner feeling of peace, a feeling of ease. That peace, that ease helps the mind to have more clarity. That supports mindfulness which allows us in turn to become more skillful with right effort. All of these practices begin in a very uh, rudimentary way. Many moments where there's no mindfulness. 
many moments when unruly thoughts take over the mind. Many moments even in meditation when the mind isn't peaceful and still. But the more we persist and just cultivate these simple practices, gradually the mind does settle down in the meditation. Gradually more clarity arises, gradually more peace accompanies that clarity. And little by little the effect of that peacefulness carries over into our daily life. And then we find that we know what we're doing more and more. We're not losing ourselves in the moment. We get to the point where we're able to think before we act, think before we speak and make choices about what we want to say or do in this moment. We find that we are able to remember that we want to now speak truthfully. We remember that we want to live harmlessly. We remember that we've made a commitment to try to be content with what we've got rather than looking at the things that are missing from our life. So the work that we do directly on the mind carries over into our daily habits and our daily habits become more in line with the Dharma and that allows the meditation to deepen. And as our meditation deepens, then our understanding of the Dharma teachings that we've heard the wisdom aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path starts to unfold for us. Many of the things that we've heard about the way the mind works, the realities of life, start to show themselves clearly in our own experience, both in the meditation and in daily life. So in terms of wisdom, the wisdom aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path, the Buddha taught that there are three characteristics, three qualities of all experience, our own experience and everyone else's experience. And that these qualities point to the laws of nature that we're all bound by and if we can understand these laws of nature and learn to live within those laws of nature accepting them and living accordingly then we can live peacefully and happily and these three characteristics are that everything that arises internally within our own mind and body, externally in the world outside, in every realm of existence, the highest heavens, the deepest areas of space, whatever you like to think of, all of those things are impermanent, changing, not constant, not forever. The second of the uh, characteristics that the Buddha pointed to is that life is fraught with suffering or unsatisfactoriness because we don't understand its changing nature, its fleeting nature, that it's everything that we take to be solid, everything that we grasp at, as being permanent, as being mine, is changing, is not as solid as it seems and one day will pass away completely. And so when we don't understand this, we suffer. Particularly when we 
spend our life living as though whatever it is that we are accomplishing, accumulating, looking after, connecting to, is going to stay the same forever. When we discover through just getting older that this body is impermanent, when we discover through the death of someone that we cl- we're close to that everything, even the most precious things, change and pass away, when our life circumstances change, when things go wrong, then we suffer if we don't know that and accept that this is the way that things are for everyone. The third characteristic, the third law of nature that the Buddha pointed to, which we can investigate, is the teaching on non-self. And this is one of the teachings which uh, people very often find very challenging in Buddhism and difficult to find difficult to approach in their daily life. What does it mean, non-self? How can I know that without being fully enlightened? So tonight I'd like to uh, talk a little bit around this teaching on non-self. Because what we have to understand is that the Buddha wasn't saying that there's no one here and that things don't exist Things do exist temporarily and we are here mentally and physically but not in the way that we assume that we are. We assume, for example, that we're here forever even though we know that no one has ever lived forever. There's still this sense in the mind of part of the mind that sort of really doesn't believe that one day it will be our turn to die. So we are here, we have form, we have mentality, we have the mind, but only temporarily. And it's not just when we die that this mind and body changes and passes away. It's changing moment by moment by moment, mentally and physically. Has anyone got the same thought in their mind now that they had when they first sat down? Has anyone got the same thought that they had in their mind when I started to talk? Has anyone got the same thought in their mind that they had five minutes ago? Mind is changing moment by moment by moment. Does anyone's body feel exactly the same way as it felt when you first sat down in this hall? Or how it felt when I started to speak? or how it felt five minutes ago. The fact that we can feel change in the mind, no change in the mind and feel change in the body are indicators of the change that is taking place all the time, moment by moment by moment, throughout the whole of our life until the time of our death. Now these are realities that we can experience directly and which can start to help us get a handle on what it means by not mine, not me, not a self. Yes, there's a mind, yes, there's a body, How much of the change that takes place 
was change that I directed, change that I wanted, change that I ordered, change that I'm in control of. That change is happening and that change is happening out of my control. These are two aspects of non-self. Why it's not me, why it's not mine, why it's not a self. It's something, but it's not what I think it is. And wrongly grasping what I think this mind and body is, is a source of suffering. I want it this way and sometimes I get it but not always and not often. And not only for me, for those I love, for those I care about, the same for them and also for me in my wanting to have control over, to own, to be in charge of those things, those people that I think of as mine. My father, my mother, my brother, my sister, my son, my daughter, my anything is also changing moment by moment by moment, mentally, physically changing according to the laws of nature, not according to wishes and desires from me or from that person. Now the direction that change takes and the way that our life goes, the Buddha said, happens according to causes and conditions and this is the uh, other aspect of the teaching on non-self. There are various factors within our own mind and body and in the world outside the mind and body which affect us and affect the change that happens the direction that change happens, the speed with which that change happens and those factors, some of them are in our control and some of them are outside of our control. Whether we have good health or bad health, whether we have an illness from birth, a congenital illness, whether we have an accident which leaves us with permanent uh, disability, permanent impairment. These are causes and conditions for effect that affect the mind and the body. What happens in the society we live in? If there's disease, if there's war, if there's stability and peace, these are causes and conditions that affect our state of well-being. Some of them outside of our control completely, some of them we can have some input to so we can vote for what kind of government we want. We can modify some of the conditions but we can't affect them completely and we can't remove them from our life. And so the teaching on non-self encourages us to understand that while we have some control, some say and can cause some modification to the way this mind and body exists and experiences, there are many causes and conditions that are outside of our domain, outside of our control. 
So again, it's not that we are absolutely at the uh, receiving end of causes and conditions that we can't modify, but that so much of our life and how our life unfolds is going to be outside of our direct control. Now the teaching, the emphasis in Buddhism is on our mental approach to life and how we can accommodate the changes that take place, how we can be at peace with the laws of nature that govern our life, govern our mind and body. And it's this mental attitude, this mental approach, which is where we find safety. Not in being able to change the outer conditions, but being able to change the way that we deal with those conditions. And one of the central aspects of that is to start to understand how everyone, all of us, are the result of the causes and conditions, the influences that we've been subject to in this life and in previous lives, that these causes and conditions produce our experience in the present moment. That's true for me, it's true for all of you. It's true for everyone that we know. None of us exists independent, independently of various causes and conditions. Now, one of the causes and conditions is that we develop the mind through meditation, that we practice the Noble Eightfold Path and live a life of integrity and cultivate wisdom and understanding. These are also causes and conditions which affect the way that we experience our life. They affect the way that we make sense of what we experience. They affect the way that we relate to the other people with whom we share our life. Understanding conditionality and how we are all dependent on various causes and conditions and that these causes and conditions produce not only how the body is, our experience in general, but produce who we think we are produce our sense of self, produce our self-image. And again, it's not that we don't have a self-image or a personality, something that we can identify as uniquely me. It's not that that doesn't exist. It's just that it doesn't exist permanently or absolutely without the possibility of modification and without change over time. The personality, the person that we think we are is just a process of cause and effect producing produced by whatever we've been influenced by and exposed to in our life, not just this life but in previous lives as well. And the sense that we make of, make of it in our present situation. As we start to practice as we start to live our life in accordance with Dharma, 
as the mind starts to settle down, becomes more peaceful, more clear seeing. In our meditation, we start to recognize the process of cause and effect, why our mood is high today or just now, what makes us feel good in this moment or what makes us feel miserable in this moment. Previously, we might have said, oh, that's just how I am. But once we've been meditating for a while and we start to have some clarity in the mind, we start to see that that mood has been produced by what we've been exposed to, perhaps just before we sat to meditate or what's happened to us during the day. And we also start to see that that mood isn't permanent. It changes, it, it actually passes away and disappears. As we meditate, we start to recognize the causes and influences that are operating in our life to produce what we call our experience, what we call me at any given moment in our life. And as we continue to practice, we see how this me is constantly changing. The me that starts off even at the beginning of a meditation is not there at the end because the mind has changed so many times between the beginning and the end. The me that I was yesterday is different from the me now. We start to recognize this in our meditation and then also to be able to see it in our daily life. And so as we take our meditation practice into daily life, we start to be able to see even more clearly how subject we are to causes and conditions, how influenced we are by what we see, by what someone says to us, by how we feel emotionally on a particular day. And the whole idea of me as being fixed and permanent, as enduring, this starts to uh, break down. This starts to become less uh, fixed in our own mind. And then we might notice that we are able to change the way that we usually react, the chain, change the way that we usually do things, something that we've been uh, holding on to as being so central to who we are, the way we always do things, the way things should be done because that's the way we've been taught, that's the way we've been brought up to believe is right we start to be able to, sit, to notice in the moment the flexibility that comes into our mind, the flexibility in our approach to practical things and even uh, things which we uh, find, have previously found to be uh, very important parts of who we are we start to see the sense of self arising in the moment and how we hold on to it, grab on to it. And then as we practice, not only we start to see the sense of self being produced, but our grip on that sense of self starts to be loosened. And there, bec there comes the wonderful moment when we can see right through our reactions that there's actually no truth to the reaction that we've got. There's no fixedness about it. There's no real me there. This is just the product of conditioning. This is just the result of what I've been taught or told or always done or always believed 
was me. And in that moment, we grasp for ourselves what the Buddha was talking about when he talked about the sense of self is produced, is manufactured, constantly changing, has no core, is not me or mine. And in that moment of penetrating, there's a falling away of all the investment that we've had in that sense of self. And in that moment, there's freedom. And this is the result of insight, of seeing through that sense of self. The result of insight is joy. And if we are practicing and gathering together the conditions for insight to arise, then we will again recognize that it doesn't arise through willpower. It doesn't arise through uh, just being clever. All the various conditions have to be there in order for insight to arise. And when it arises, it arises out of the blue. It arises very often when we're least expecting it. But it arises because we've produced all the necessary causes and conditions through our cultivation of the whole of the Noble Eightfold Path. And when we have penetrated to the truth of the teaching, we've moved into the third uh, stage of the development of the path, and that is what's called in Pali, Pativeda. That is where we penetrate to the truth for ourselves. We understand the teaching at a profound level, not only so that we understand it, but that we experience the joy of letting go in that moment. And the fruit of that insight is joy. And this can happen in the most mundane circumstances. It doesn't happen necessarily in the middle of meditation. It can happen when we're going about our daily life. But it can only happen when we have taken the practice from the cushion, from the meditation time, into our daily life. And that means cultivating all the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, keeping precepts, actively developing generosity, loving kindness, care and concern for others, selflessness in our daily actions, thought, speech and action. And then practicing right effort, trying to be mindful, trying to let go of negative thoughts, trying to develop the peace of mind that comes from being able to stay in the present moment mindfully. When all of those things are present, then insight arises by itself. And someone gave a very good example of this arising of uh, insight leading to peace, leading to freedom, happening in the most mundane way. Someone who comes to the monastery regularly and who does cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path in all its aspects and has been for some years. And this, I'm saying this because we need to understand that these fruits come through the cultivation of the necessary conditions. This person told me that they went to the supermarket, their local supermarket, did their shopping and one of the items that they purchased was deodorant. Very mundane, nothing special about deodorant. They took their shopping home, they put the deodorant away 
and a couple of weeks later when they took it out to use it they realised that they'd bought the wrong kind of deodorant. They wanted, um, they didn't want an antiperspirant, they just wanted a deodorant, so it was the wrong one. So they were very fortunate, they still had their uh, docket from uh, the shop and so they took the deodorant back to the shop and they wanted to exchange it for the one that they usually get. Now this shop was their local shop and they'd been shopping there for years and so they expected that they would be able to get a refund. Now they took their deodorant to the um, girl on the counter and she said, oh no, sorry, we can't give you a refund. You've had it too long. And the person said, but I've got my docket and I always shop here. I'm a regular customer. I've been coming here since the kids were small. So the, shop, the uh, counter girl went and got her supervisor to see whether the uh, deodorant could be exchanged. And uh, the supervisor said, well, we don't usually, uh, you know, exchange, we're bound by rules, but I'm a, I'm a regular customer. I always come here. I mean, I could shop up, at, up the road at Woolworths, but I always come here to give you uh, my support. I've been coming here for years. Now, the person, because they were a very good practitioner, was practising speaking kindly not speaking in an, an abrupt and rude way, watching their speech, but they were also watching the internal process, how they were feeling inside, and they could notice they were starting to feel a lot of heat in the body. And this heat was getting stronger, getting hotter. And not only was it uh, getting hotter, it was starting to spread throughout the whole of their body and it was starting to become like um, prickly heat, not just uh, a mild warmth and they could feel that their heart was starting to pound and their stomach was starting to uh, flutter because this wasn't now just about the deodorant, this was about who do you think I am? I'm a good person. I'm an honest person, I'm a reliable person, I'm a regular customer, you can trust me, I've been coming here for years, I support this shop with my custom. And so uh, she persisted and so the supervisor went and got another supervisor to come to discuss the deodorant. And of course the story was the same, we can't uh, return... Uh, exchange it, we can't put it back on the shelf, you might have tampered with it. Tampered with it? I'm an honest person. I tell you, I haven't used it and I've got the docket. Now the person was able to apply the teaching that she had been hearing, learning, investigating for so many years. Not only could she notice that she was getting emotionally involved but she suddenly had a flash that this was no longer about the deodorant. This was about who I am. Her sense of self was being affronted by the fact that these people would not exchange the deodorant that she'd brought. And she said, in a flash, in a moment, the whole idea of trying to project herself into this whole scenario suddenly became apparent. And all of the thoughts that were in her mind justifying why these people should do this for her, all of those thoughts which had been like loudspeakers blaring in her mind, she suddenly saw what it was. This was all sense of self. And in that moment, as she saw her sense of self, she was able to see from their point of view that here were people doing their job 
They had uh, guidelines they had to follow, rules that they had to obey. It wasn't about her not being an honest person or her not being a good enough customer or her not being uh, uh, reliable enough or whatever it was that she was trying to uh, project for them to see. It was because they had to follow the rules and they only had so much leeway to uh, operate within. And in the moment of letting go of her own self-importance, she saw it from their perspective. And she was able to let go. It didn't matter. Okay, can't exchange the uh, deodorant. I'll have to get another one. And all the thoughts about, I'll never shop in this shop again. They'll be sorry that they treated me this way. I'll let everyone know what they do to their good customers. All of those thoughts just vanished. And she said that as she walked out of the shop, a big smile came across her face and she realised that she had just had an insight into non-self. And the big smile, the joy, was the freedom. The freedom that is not only the promise, but the fact, the reality of practicing this path. Being able to put oneself in someone else's shoes, being able to feel how they must feel, becomes more possible when one recognises conditionality and non-self. We all are the products of our experience. We are all subject to the conditions that we've been exposed to, the conditioning that we've been exposed to. And if we can see our own conditioning, then we can more easily see the conditioning that has produced the person who's standing in front of us or that is affecting them as they stand in front of us. And we can more easily empathise with that person, see it from their point of view, recognise why they are like they are. doesn't mean that we agree with it, approve of it, would like to be like that ourselves, but we understand where they're coming from. And then with compassion we can do what needs to be done. Trying not to create suffering for ourselves, trying not to create suffering for others. In this case, the uh, suffering might have been, I'm never going to shop here again and now I have to go and shop uh, at another place. These are the sorts of uh, situations that we get ourselves in where we take something personally and we carry it with us for the rest of the day, for the rest of the week, for the rest of our life. Never going to get over that one because it was, when it comes down to it, an affront to my sense of self. And the freedom that arises is the freedom that is possible even in more difficult circumstances than just trying to return an unwanted object to the uh, shop. The more we cultivate this path and the uh, stronger our wisdom becomes, the more freedom we have to live our life in accordance with the laws of nature and free from the suffering that comes from not accepting things as they really are. The more that we're able to live our lives like that personally, the more space we give others to live their lives, not always uh, expecting that people are going to live up to who we think they should be. Because one of the... Uh, pitfalls for us all is that we not only have a strong sense of who we are or should be but we also project onto others who we think they are, who we think they should be and that is another cause of suffering. So I encourage uh, all of you to reflect on 
how we produce the sense of who we are, the very uh, easy way to see through this is to notice change as it arises in the mind and in the body, to see the insubstantiality of what we take to be something that's very solid and fixed. And then as you continue to develop the mind in meditation particularly, to keep on investigating what is the cause for the effect that I'm experiencing right now and to start to identify more and more the influences that produce our experience in this moment and what we take to be me and mine. So I hope that this teaching has been of benefit to all of you and may the merit of this teaching help us all to attain Nibbāna. Does anyone have any questions or comments about this teaching tonight? Yes? If there's no self, what about the underlying continuity, say, from the previous life? And again, the way we... It doesn't matter what I tell you or what you read in books. What we have to uh, experience for ourselves to be really convinced about non-self is to see the arising and passing away that happens but the continuity that is also observable. And we do that by starting to observe the arising and passing away as it happens moment by moment in this life right now. When we, particularly when we cultivate the mind in meditation and when we become more mindful of the mind and the body, we start to experience how the thoughts, thoughts do arise and pass away, arise and pass away moment by moment by moment right now and what produces them what produces them is the nature of the mind itself that it's a re reaction machine basically taking in information taking in data through the sense doors and reacting to it it's what the apparatus does but that it's constantly uh, changing it doesn't last more than a blip and we can only really notice this clearly when we have developed the mind in meditation but then we can know for ourselves, arising and passing away according to causes and conditions and that, that there is a continuity there but it isn't a continuity that isn't made up of individual moments of consciousness. Now, you can't know that. Um, you can hear it. This is the first stage of uh, the practice of, of the path, is to hear it from me. Then you start to investigate it for yourself by doing all the practice that's necessary, cultivating the Noble Eightfold Path, developing the mind in meditation to the point where you can observe for yourself that arising and passing away and at that point penetrate to the truth. Ah, that is the way things are. Only then will you know for yourself. And then you'll know about past lives too and how it's possible. The, the question is, is the arising and passing away of consciousness, is that the whole thing that's happening? Momentary, yes. Arising and ceasing. And the knowing that knows the arising and ceasing is also passing away. So there is not the arising and passing away of uh, sense experience or thinking, for example, and then uh, an, an unbroken knowing of that the mind that knows also arises and passes away. But it's such 
happening at such rapid speed that it's impossible to notice with uh, a mind that's not developed in meditation. It's like trying to observe uh, something without the right instrument, without the right kind of um, uh, scientific instrument, uh, the speed of, of objects, for example. You need the right instrument. So the mind has to be developed to become the right instrument, the right kind of instrument to be able to notice that and then to know for, clearly for oneself that's the way it is. And every part of the Noble Eightfold Path is a necessary constituent ingredient of that developed mind. And that's what the story of the uh, person who had an insight into non-self is very um, illustrative of that because this is a person who has been cultivating sila, samadhi and panya, little, little insights, little understandings for years until a profound insight that actually stops you in your track and stops you from getting involved in a whole uh, unpleasantness until that kind of uh, uh, insight arises. And if you just think about how often how we, we hear about people who have um, a rage reaction because someone has slighted them, slighted their sense of self, someone cuts in on you in the, on the highway, this leads people to go and beat someone up. Someone looks at you the wrong way or calls you a name you don't like does something which you think is fundamental to who I am and uh, people end up killing. People have this uh, very strong sense of these people belong to me, they're mine, my children, I can't live without them. People kill their children because they think of them as mine, can't live without them. And this all comes from the wrong idea of self. So we're not talking about something which is just uh, uh, unimportant or insignificant. This is what propels us in our thought, speech and action. And so it's uh, really important that we start to understand it. And we understand it by starting to approach it even in... Uh, very simple way of watching the change that happens in this mind and body as we go through the course of a day. So I think that's probably enough and I'd like to ask um, Jake to make the announcements for the